Let us pray the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have re revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, right through to chapter 4, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Okay, it's been quite a while since I'm up here. All right, yesterday was nominations day, and so the battle lines have been drawn, and uh, we, are, we are now to see what happens. The question is, do you, all know, have you, have you, do you all know what's going on? Do you all know who your candidates are? Since the battle line has been drawn, do you know who your candidates are? Okay, I mean, I know you. I know our church. A lot of people are very political. I mean, you all get excited during election time. You know, you all get so riled up, so excited, so full of energy, and you can be so passionate about it. But I wonder, do you all even know who your candidates are? Okay, let's see. In Subang Jaya, Parliament for Subang Jaya is four people this year: To Sin Wan, Bebas, Wong Chen, PKR. Tan Siong Lim, Barisan, Muhammad Sharia, Pass. This Toh Sin Wan, I don't really know who he is. Uh, the last year also, he's the last round, he also stand. And I think he won something like 300 votes out of 70,000 votes or something like that. Alright, for the Dun Negara, we have Michelle Ng, PKR, Toh Sin Wan, Bebas, Chong Awad, Barisan. Uh, this used to be Henayo's seat. Now Henayo has left and we have replaced with Michelle Ng. And Barisan has put in a new guy, Chong Ah Wat, a major, I heard, a retired major. Alright, so how well are you? How well do you all know your position, your seats? Who is it? Tangga Batu. Who's in Tangga Batu side? Claybang area. Tangga Batu, ah? Who's your candidate? Tatao Nama. Takenal Nama. Ayo. 
Tangga batu Rusna binti Aluai Zali bin Mat Yasin And Zulkifi bin Ismail Hang Tua Jaya Who's on Hang Tua Jaya side? Oh, go up north a bit Kunrai, Hang Tua Jaya Hello, hello, hello Okay, so who is Hang Tua Jaya? Hello Hello Okay, is it still working? It's completely out Hello Testing, testing Hello? Hello? So which is working now? This? Hello? Hello? Oh, mine is working again. Okay, never mind. We put this aside there. Alright. Okay, so Hang Tua Jaya, who do we have? Shams, where's Hang Tua Jaya? Shamsul Iskandar. Muhammad Ali bin Rustam. Uh, Ali bin Muhammad Rustam. Muhammad Khalid bin Kasim. Do you know, do you, do you, do you know this beforehand? You know, huh? Okay. Kota Melaka people. Do you all know or not? Kota Melaka. Who's Kota Melaka people? Who are your candidates? Don't look at the list. Ah, yeah, you look already. <laughs> Do you, all, you know, sometimes we get so passionate about elections, but we don't even take the time to know who our candidates are. We don't even take the time to know who the individuals are. And sometimes I wonder what are we so passionate about if we don't even know who are standing, who you are going to vote for, who these individuals, this name are. You know, I came to Malacca about uh, five years ago. That's 2013, I came to Malacca. And that was the year we had GE 13. That was the year, GE 13, when I came to Malacca. And a lot of people was asking me that time. They were asking, I mean, not asking me, they were asking each other. The word was going around. People were asking one another and they were wondering, who does Pastor Andrew vote for? Five years later, church members are still wondering, who does Pastor Andrew vote for? Well, let's, let's give it a few more weeks and let's see whether you all can figure out who does Pastor Andrew vote for. But beside that, beside that million dollar question, we have a more important questions to ask ourselves today. You know that as a Malaysian Christian in Malaysia today as a Malaysian Christian at a time such as this the question we need to ask ourselves is what role am I playing? What role should I be playing? As a Christian, as a Malaysian Christian what is my role in the nation? Well, in a nutshell you just put it into a nutshell it's very simple well, we are called to be watchmen we are called to be a watchman who can watch over the nation. We are called to be watchmen to, to know the times and the seasons of our nation, to understand what God is doing in our nation, to understand what God wants to be done, what God wants to accomplish in our nation. And that's what we are called to do. We are called to recognize the warning signs that comes in our land. We are called to be a voice that speaks for the right, for God's will over our land but many times I fear that the church or the Christian community is more like what Jesus says in Matthew 16 he says this he says then, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him and asked that he would show them a sign from heaven he answered and said to them when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And many times I, wonder, I fear that, you know, for us, the church today, we have become like that. The church has become like that, that where we can, we can discern, we can discern, we can see things that's happening, but we can't discern. In fact, you can write the first point of your notes is this, that many see what is happening. Many, the first point in, your, in the notes in your bulletin, the first point, many see what is happening, but only a few can discern what God is doing. Many sees. Many of us, we can see what is happening. We can see what's happening in the land. We can see what's happening in our nation. We can see. But how many of us actually discern? Because it's not easy to discern. You see, friends, you know, seeing uh, is, 
it's a lot of levels, you know. Sometimes many of us, we, can only, we only see the surface of what's happening. And on the surface, we look at our nation, we see, okay, we see there's corruption that is going on rampant, yes. But do you know that our nation is not the worst in corruption, by the way? There are countries that have worse corruption, but yet, nevertheless, we can see corruption is rampant. We see oppositions that has a lot of infighting and cannot get their act together. We see a lot of mismanagement of uh, national resources, of government uh, departments, and... Some of us see and we think that this will happen, this will win, this fellow will win, that fellow will win. We think that. We look at the surface and we hear a lot of things. But do you know that a lot of these things that we see on the surface has completely two worldviews? It just depends on which, like which, which worldview you are seeing. You know, it's like in an election that was happened in uh, America recently, the, uh, the, the, the presidential election. Donald Trump won, right? Way before he won, everybody said he would have lost. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not supporting either candidate. Right? Don't, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is this. If you, most of us in Malaysia, we also thought that Donald Trump would lose. A lot of church members were telling me, yay, we're going to get the first president, female president of America, yay. We all thought that Donald Trump would lose. Why? Because we hear that the people don't like him, everything don't like him, and we hear it from CNN. Because that's what we get in Malaysia, right? CNN. And we hear CNN. But do you know that if you are in America, and if you watch CNN, you will watch a complete different worldview, where the whole country is anti-Donald Trump, and it's impossible that Donald Trump won. But if you watch Fox News, which we don't get here, then you'll see a complete different worldview. A worldview where Donald Trump is the hero and the saviour of America, and the whole nation is supporting him, and he will win. Two complete different worldview from the two different news channels. And why it all depends on how we see things. And many times we see things on the surface, but we don't, we don't even see below the surface. What happened? What, 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 and many, few, few will actually see below the surface. In fact, many of us, we see, the, we see what's happening on top, but do we even see what's happening below the surface? Like the increased polarization in our land. How many of us actually notice that? How many of us actually notice the increased Islam, Islamization that is happening in the grassroots level, in the institutions, that is encroaching in every sphere of life? How many of us actually see the terrorism threat that is growing stronger every day? Just because you haven't got bombed yet, it doesn't mean that the threat wasn't growing stronger. And it's just a matter of time before something happens. How many of us actually see the increasing intolerance in this land? Whether it is political intolerance, you know, last time you, you can be political enemies and still be friends, today you find it so difficult. The religious intolerance in this nation, last time we can have different, different religions and we still be friends, today it seems so difficult. The racial intolerance, we no longer see Malay, Indian, Chinese all hanging out together. Malays will hang out with Malays, Indians with Indians, Chinese with Indians. The increasing racial polarization. Do we see the increased hatred and suspicion among the citizens of the land? Where we all view each other with suspicion, we view each other from the other side with hatred and suspicion. Do we see the increasing authoritarianism in our nation? Whether it be in the ruling government or whether it be in the opposition party, do you see signs of this authoritarianism, this uh, corruption that is coming up? Do we see those signs? Can we see those things that is below the surface? But not only are we called to see the things that are below the surface, we are called as people of God, not just to see what's happening, but to discern the heart of God. To discern what God is doing. To discern what God wants to be done. And friend, that is not easy. That is not easy. Because you see, friends, many can see the surface what's happening. Very few would actually try to see below the surface and even fewer will want to discern the heart of God because it's not easy because very often what we see with our natural eyes is not what God has in mind in the spiritual and many times what we see naturally we think is best we think is good spiritually in the long run in the end of the day in God's master plan it turned out otherwise it's very difficult to discern. Let me just give you some examples, you know. There are tons of examples. And the reason why we have to discern, because we, the ch church, is, are called, you know, like the Bible says, the sons of Issachar. 
who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And that's what the church is called to be, to be a people who understand what God is doing, to understand what God desires, who understand what God is working in this nation so that we know what to do. But I say it's not easy. I'll give you many examples. I can't, I can't throw all the scriptures out, but I'll just give you examples. Number one is like the life of Solomon, King Solomon. When he came into power, everybody thought he was a good king, a, known as the most wisest king, a great king, a king who built the temple of God, the first temple that was a hero. But do you know that in Solomon's reign, he was also a slave driver? He enslaved his people. He put a burden upon them that was so heavy that when he died, there was widespread rebellion over the nation. That Solomon was also a murderer. That Solomon was also someone who, who used murder to silence political dissent. He was such a person. Another example is Hezekiah. Oh, the Bible tells us Hezekiah was, after a whole long list of evil king, came a righteous king called Hezekiah. He was righteous and he was the one who brought revival into the land of Israel. He brought the people of Israel back to God. But do you know that at the end of his life, he, Hezekiah received an envoy from the Babylonians. You can go back and read in 2 Kings 18 to 20, chapter 18 to 20. An envoy came from Babylonia. And Hezekiah was so proud. He said, Come, let me show you my entire wealth of my nation. And he showed the envoys everything that the nation had. And the Lord pronounced judgment on Hezekiah. And he told Hezekiah, Because you've done this, everything that you showed the Babylonian envoys will be taken away by them. And that's what happened. A few, a few years later, the whole nation of Israel, everything was wiped out and destroyed by the Babylonian. Why? A righteous king. But yet, things may not turn out. We do not know. It's very hard to discern. Let me give you another example. Hezekiah had a son. And his son was King Manasseh. And the Bible tells us this is a crook. A real crook. A real evil king. A king who, 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 who led Israel to do more evil than any generations before it. Before the people who are, you know, that's so how bad he was. Such an evil king. But the Bible tells us that when at the end of his life, when Manasseh, when King Manasseh was at, his, was at the bottom, and he cried out to God. And God heard him. And God forgave him. And God restored him. It's not easy. It's easy to see, but it's hard to discern the heart of God. Another example in history, King Nebuchadnezzar, very famous king in history. He's, he killed thousands of people. He's someone who massacred nations. You know, no, 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 don't just kill people. He genocide nations. He uproot nations and throw them away. And you know what the Bible calls him? The Bible calls him, he calls him in Jeremiah 25 verse 9, he calls him my servant. God calls him my servant. Cyrus, the, the guy who defeated the Babylonian Empire, he's just as bad as them. The Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian, wiped them out. He's just as terrible a king as, as, as the, the one he wiped out. But he was the one that God used to send the Jews back to Israel to rebuild the temple of Israel. And the Bible, and you know what God calls him in Isaiah 42, 28? He says, Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. God calls Cyrus his shepherd. Another example is the Arab Spring. The recent example. In 2011, all nations in Arab, a bunch of them, had a re revolt after a revolt after a revolt. Why? Because they were trying to overthrow a dictator government, which is true. When we look with our natural eyes, we will say, yes, these are dictators, these are authoritarians, these people need to be go. And so Mubarak was removed from Egypt, Gaddafi was removed from Libya, uh, Assad, they tried to remove Assad from Syria, and uh, Yemen and Bahrain, all these had revolutions. Today, Seven years later, the nations are no better. In fact, places like Syria and Yemen, the war goes on until today. Lives are being lost until today. People are dying until today. In fact, I even saw a documentary recently. They were talking about the Iraq invasion. How after how the one of the person was saying, you know, they said, yeah, they supported the Iraq invasion. They wanted to get rid of Saddam. 
But now after how many years Saddam Hussein is gone, he says, things were better when Saddam was in power. Things were better when Saddam Hussein was in power. That was a citizen that says, and sometimes you see, that's right, please don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying who or what, but what I'm saying is this, it's very hard for us to discern. As people, very often it's easy to see things with the natural, but it's very difficult to discern the plan of God, to discern what God is trying to do in our land. But as people of God, we are called not just to follow the popular opinion, but we are called to be people of discernment, to be people who know the heart of God and to know what God is trying to do in our land. We are called to be such a people. We are not called to be a people to just go with the flow, to follow, follow, follow a popular opinion and just go with the flow. No, we have to be a people that are different. And that's why the church is called to be the salt and light to the nation. A salt and light is supposed to be something that is different from the nation. That when the nation is moving somewhere, when the nation is in a certain condition, the salt and light rises above. We live in a standard that is above the rest of the nation. We walk in a standard that is above the rest of the nation. And my fear today is when I see the church, when it comes to election time, the church behaves no different from the rest of the world or the rest of the nation. The church acts the same way. The church talks the same way. The church behaves the same way. The church gets angry the same way. And we need to be different. We need to live at a higher standard. We need to follow a higher level of integrity than the rest of the nation. Question then is, how do we do that? How do we discern what God is doing? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer. I can't give you the answer for that. Because there's no, there's no step one, step two, step three for you to discern. But there is one thing that I think all of us need to learn. Because there is one big stumbling block from discerning God's will in our lives or in the lives of the people around us. And that is not giving into hate, anger, and dissatisfaction. You see, friends, when we allow hate and anger to fill our hearts, when we allow hate and anger and dissatisfaction to fill our hearts, whether it is against government, against political parties, against people in our company, people in our lives, relatives, friends, doesn't matter. But whenever, wherever, whichever area in our lives, if we allow hate and anger and dissatisfaction to fill our hearts, we will be blind God's heart. We will be blind to what God is trying to do in our midst. And so for us, for starting, if you really want to discern what God is doing, we need to first start by removing hate, anger, and dissatisfaction from our hearts. What's the danger of it? What's the danger of hate, anger, and dissatisfaction? Well, let me tell you, number one, you can write in your note, when we are motivated by hate, by anger, by dissatisfaction, number one, we are likely to fail to recognize God's messiahs. You know, in a time, in a nation of ours, like our nation like today, where we are increasingly being polarized, where intolerance is rising, where hatred among races, among religious people, are, different religion groups are rising, the church cannot afford to let hate enter its heart. The church cannot afford to be people of anger, people of hate, people of dissatisfaction. The church just cannot afford it. But unfortunately, when I look at the church today, I see no different from the rest of the nation. We carry the same hatred. We carry the same anger. We carry the same dissatisfaction. We cannot afford it. When we get angry, when we fill our hearts with hate and anger, we will fail to recognize God's Messiah. Let me give you an example. Jesus during Israel's time. Hey, don't get me wrong. Huh? When I use the word Messiah here, I'm not talking about uh, some party is a Messiah, some party is an anti-Messiah. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. During Jesus' time, when he, was the, when he came, Israel was being occupied by the Roman Empire. The Romans were in control of Israel. And the people of Israel hated the Romans. They are, and, and rightly so. They were oppressors. They were corrupt. They, were, they abused the people. They took advantage of the resources. They, they, the Romans was different. If I'm a Roman citizen, different, different privilege. You're not Roman citizen, even though this is your land, you have a different status. That is how the Roman Empire was run. 
And the Israelites hated, the Jews hated the Romans. They hated the Romans and they knew their scripture. They knew the Bible. And they knew their scripture. The scripture told them that God would send a Messiah. A Christ who would deliver them out from oppression. A Messiah who would restore the glory of the nation of Israel. And the people of Israel, you know what they did? They took those promises. They believed in God and they were waiting for the Messiah. The only problem was, they were waiting for a political Messiah. One who would come and overthrow the Roman government. One who would come and lead them in revolt and be a nation once again. One who would restore Israel as a great empire once again. And they waited. And they were waiting. And they were eager. Year come, year pass, they were getting more and more eager. And because of their hatred towards the Roman and their eagerness for the political Messiah, when God finally sent His true Messiah, when God finally sent Jesus Christ into the world, the Jews could not see it. The Jews could not realize it. The Jews could not, they, they, the Jews could not identify it. The Jews, the Jews could not identify it. They can't see it. They can't recognize that the Messiah is there. They couldn't see it because they were full of hatred. They were full of anger. Please don't get me wrong, friends. I'm not saying that any party is a messiah or any party is an anti-messiah. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. That if you really want to see a difference in this land, it's not going to come from political messiahs. It's not going to come from political parties or politicians. You have to look and see what God is doing in this land. You have to see what what God is trying to do in our land. It's not going to come from political messiahs. What happened to Israel in the end? Because when they, when they close their hearts and their, their mind is only towards removing the Roman Empire, what happened to the Jews at the end of the day was they couldn't see Jesus. And when Jesus died, there was, when Jesus died and rose again, there was only about 120 people who followed him out of a whole nation of the Jews. 99% of the Jews did not accept Jesus Christ. In the end, what happened? Well, they waited. They continued to wait for their political Messiah and He came. About 30 years later, some heroes came, started uh, stirred up a rebellion in Israel. And the nation of Israel actually overthrew the Roman Empire. And some of the leaders were the high priests of the Jews and some other leaders. They overthrew the Roman and they were a free nation for three years. They were a free nation. And the Romans came back. And the Romans destroyed the Jewish state. They destroyed the temple in AD 70. They destroyed the entire nation. And until today, that temple has never been rebuilt. And until 1948, the nation never came back together. 2,000 years, the nation was destroyed. Why? Because the people allowed hate to blind their eyes from what God is doing in the land. Firstly, hate will blind us from, the, from God's plans. Secondly, hate, will, when we are motivated by hate, we, we are likely to become blind to the evil or the danger within us. We are likely to become blind to the evil around us, to the, to the dangers that are around us. When we allow hate to rule our hearts, we will not see the danger that is around us. We will see the danger and the evil on the other side. But we won't see the danger or the evil around us or within us. And that's the danger. Let me go back again to the example of Jesus. When Jesus was arrested and they, and they brought him before Pilate and Pilate wanted to release Jesus, he told the Jews, I have here two persons. I have Barabbas and I have Jesus. I will give you one. Choose who do you want to be released. We know how the story goes. Luke 21, 33, 18 says this, And they all cried out at once, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, 
who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for and for what? Murder. Murder. You see, friends, when they are, you see, why why the Jews wanted Barabbas? Simple. Because he was a rebel fighter. And I told you they hated the Romans. He was a rebel fighter. But they are willing to have Barabbas over Jesus because he represented their hate. He represented their anger. And they chose Barabbas, a murderer. Doesn't matter if he's a murderer. He fits our anger. He fits our hatred. He chose Barabbas over Jesus. And we look back at the Israelites and say, ah, yeah, this stupid fellow. Lah. Why are they like that one? Lah? And we think that all the Jews are evil. But in reality, it's not. When we allow hate to fill our hearts, it blinds us. We won't see our faults. We won't see the evil. We will, we, in fact, we will close a blind eye to the things that are not right around us because our hate blinds us. Our anger blinds us. Our discontentment blinds us. And we cannot be such people. The church cannot afford to be a people who are full of hate, anger and discontentment. And that's what happened to Nazi Germany. You know Nazi Germany what happened? When Hitler came on the rise, the church liked him. The church liked Hitler because he was popular. The church was popular. And so when Hitler started doing things, the church kept quiet. When Hitler doing, did more things, the church kept quiet until it was too late. When the church finally spoke up, the damage was done. It was too late. The Nazi party had complete control and the church was silenced. That's what happened in Germany. Because when we allow hatred to fill our hearts, you know the church, the German people at that time, they were hateful. They were hateful of who? They were hateful of all the European powers, those who oppressed them after World War I. The British, the French, who, who defeated them after World War I, who put humiliating conditions on the nation of, of Germany. They hated the European powers. And that's why Hitler was able to rise and the church kept silent. And when evil came, the church was silent. That is the danger when we allow hate to fill our hearts. Sometimes today, when I look at the nation today, you know, people always say, you know, I, I mean, sometimes we, we, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, people always say, you know, uh, some A will win, no matter who it is, E will win. We will vote for them. And that's the danger, friends. We always say, even if a monkey were to stand under a certain banner, it will win, even though it's a monkey. And that is the danger. And sometimes it, it, it shows the state of our nation. How the people of the nation are so filled with anger and hatred that whoever stands, even if he's a good person, even if he's a righteous person, but because his skin color is different from mine, and because he stands with someone that I don't like, with, uh, with other things that I don't like, but he's a righteous man. And when I have a devil standing there, who is not the person that is, is unrighteous, whose character, who everything is against what I stand for. But yet, he's the same color as me. I vote for the unrighteous devil than the righteous angel. Because of hatred. Because of anger. It blinds us. It blinds us to the evil around us. And thirdly, friends, When we are motivated by hate, anger, or dissatisfaction, which is the, this, we are, this is the most important friends, we tend to be detached from the heartbeat of God. We tend to be detached. We tend to be misaligned with God's heart, with what God wants, with God's passion, God's heartbeat, God's cry for the people, for the nation. We tend to miss out on it. A good example of that is Jonah. Jonah. God sent Jonah to the people of Nineveh to preach the gospel to them, to preach God to them. Jonah hated the Ninevites. Rightly so. They were a bunch of cruel people. They were evil. They oppressed the Israelites. They killed, they murdered, they do genocide. They, they, they have debauchery. They are, they, are, they are the worst lot of people. And Jonah hated them. And Jonah went. Forced to, he went. 
he preached the gospel. And listen what happened. Verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, Jonah. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tashish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, but it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right? You see, Jonah was angry. Why? Because when he preached the gospel to Nineveh, they repented. They came to God. And God forgave them. And Jonah was angry. Jonah said, I, God, I cannot accept. I cannot accept you accepting them. I cannot accept you forgiving them. I want to see them die. And Lord said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right? You see, friends, Jonah knew the heart of God. He knew that God is gracious. He said, Lord, I know you will forgive them, that's why I don't want to come. He knew God loved the people. He knew God is slow to anger. That God, you know, he knew the heart of God. But yet, when it comes to it, he refused to allow the heart of God for his heart to match the heart of God. Because his hatred for the Ninevites. His hatred for the Ninevites. That's why 1 Timothy 2 3 says this For this is good and accepted in the sight of the Lord, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the cry of God. He wants to see everyone saved. He wants to see the salvation of the nation. Not just the few Chinese, Chinese and Indians sitting here. He wants to see the whole nation saved. The Malays, the Muslims, the people from up north, the people from Pass. The people from PKR, from Pribumi, from Amana. God wants to see them saved. God wants their salvation. Can you feel that heartbeat of God? Can you feel that cry of God? That God wants to see these people saved. That's why as a church, friends, we cannot afford to allow hate to come in our hearts. We cannot allow our hearts to be filled with hate and anger. Because it will cloud us from seeing what God is seeing. It will blind us from seeing what God is seeing in our nation. So what can we do? I know it's not easy not to hate. I also hate. I also get angry. I also see a lot of things that, that rouse me up, that makes me angry, that makes me disappointed. But how do I guard my heart? You see, friends, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about your votes, you know. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about votes. I'm talking about the condition of your hearts. I'm not talking about who you should vote for, who you should not vote for. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about who you're voting for. I'm talking about the condition of your heart. Because when I look at the nation today, I fear this. This is my fear as a pastor and as a church. We can win certain things in the election. But will we lose our soul in the process? We can win certain things. But will we lose our soul in the process? Will we lose ourselves to hatred, anger, and bitterness? Even though we win, will we lose in the end? Remember Jesus says in Matthew, He says, what profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and loses his soul? He's talking about money, yes. But the same applies. What profits the church if we win whatever we want to win this coming round and loses our soul in the process? Don't get me wrong. I'm neither pro any pro someone or pro something else. But the fact if you are sitting here today this morning and you hear what I'm saying and you feel angry, you feel unhappy that pastor is saying such things, then chances are there's hate in your heart. Chances are there's anger in your heart. And that's why you feel that way. But we as a church cannot afford to be people of hate, people of anger, because our soul is more important than our votes. So what should we do? What can we do? Well, the last point, only love can counter hate. Only love can counter hate. Only when we allow our hearts to be a heart of love can it counter the hate in our heart. 
Bible tells us in Matthew 5.44, it says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes the sun rise on the evil, on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And He goes on to say in 1 Timothy 2, it says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable life in all godliness ever. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, trust me, friends. I've tried. I've tried all I can do to wriggle my way out of this scripture. I've tried all I can to justify why I don't have to love my enemy, why I don't have to pray for them, why I don't have to bless them. I've tried. And you tell you, friends, I can't find a reason not to. I tried. I look at scriptures. I try to find ways out of this. And I can't find any way out of it. You know why? Because God knows that the only way to guard our hearts from hate is to love. Is to love. And then God says, love your enemies. Very simple. Today, who's your enemy? I think that's very simple. In, when we come to this season of our life, this time of our life, very simple. Who's your enemy? Most of you have decided who you're going to vote for. I know that. Your enemy, the person you're going to vote against. That's your enemy. And the Bible says, love them. Love doesn't mean you vote. Lah. But the Bible is saying, you love them. What the Bible says, you pray for them. You, if, you, if you feel that the other side has, has you know, the Bible, says, the Bible says, bless those who curse you. If you feel the other, the one that you are voting against has been cursing you, that he has been saying things racist about you, that he has been cursing your race, your people, your what, then the Bible tells us, you bless them. Do good to those who hate you. If you feel those on the other side hate you because of the way they do charama, the way they say things, you pray for them. You do good to them. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If you feel that the policies that they have been promoting have persecuted you, have made life miserable, have spited you, you pray for them. So this is my challenge for the church today. I know it's not going to be easy. And I know it's very difficult to do. But this is my challenge for all of you today. Because you see, I'm more interested in your soul than your vote. It's your soul that matters. I want all of you to do this. From today until polling day, find out who your constituents, your, your, your Ali, your nominate, the, the candidates are. And I want you to do this. I want you to pray for your enemy. In your quiet time. Don't, 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 don't need to pray for your own candidates. Okay, God knows your heart. Idea. One, no need to pray. Pray. In fact, pray more. You pray one minute for your candidate, you pray five minutes for your enemy. Pray for your enemy. Look who that person is. Find out his name. Find out his wife's name. Find out his family. Find out his children. Pray for them. Not just pray, you know. Bible say you bless them. You bless them in your prayers. You pray God. You bless them, Lord. Bless them with health. You bless their health. You bless their family. You bless their, their job. You bless their person. You bless them. You do good to them in your prayer. I'm not asking you to go up to them and and anything, nothing. Just in your prayers. Pray for your enemies. Bless your enemies. You know why? Because that will guard your heart. That will guard your heart. It will be awkward at first. It will be irritating at first. It will feel so difficult at first. But it will cleanse your heart from hate. I try to close with this testimony. You know what? Let me just sit down here a bit. Lah. <laughs> you know, I, like many of us, I grew up hating the Malays. I grew up prejudiced. Let's be honest, lah, huh? especially if you are a Chinese like me. We Chinese are very racist people by nature. It's in our psyche. All right? I mean, okay, lah, just forgive me, uh, the Indians and the Westerners who are here. We Chinese, okay, at least, at least the Hokkien Lang Lai races, la, huh? the Hokkien Chinese, what do we normally call people? Is in our psyche. We call the Indians Klingakui, Huanatu, and Angmokau. We do that, right? Okay, let me explain. Please, 
This is our our language. Okay, it's not 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 my thinking. But this is how racist the Chinese by culture are. Klingna kui basically means Indian devil or Indian ghost. Kwana tu means Malay pig. Ang mokau means Western uh, Western dog or Western monkey. Do you know how you pronounce it? And that's how we describe the other races by our language. But the only people we call we we describe ourselves we call tenglang. Chinese people. We describe everybody else as monkeys, dogs, and Indians. That is the Chinese psyche. And I grew up in that kind of environment. I grew up in that kind of psyche. And for years, I hated the Malays. I seen the way they do things. I seen the way they treated me. I've seen the policies they do. And I grew up. I don't like them. And when I went to university, we all Chinese were with Chinese Malays were with Malays. And the way they behave, they're always at the bottom class. We're always at the top class. Lagi lah, we look down on them. And I despise them. Until one day, the Lord had to deal with me, and I began to pray for them. I began to pray. After all, we always hear about Malays how they disturb, I mean, Islamize our religion, how they want to against us and all that. And I began to pray. I began to pray for the salvation of the Malays in this land. I began to pray for God to do something among the Malays. I prefer you to pray for God's will upon. And you know, friends, the more I pray, it's awkward at first. I feel hatred. Ever, I feel uncomfortable. I don't want to. But the more I do it, it cleanses my heart. All that anger, all that hatred, all that frustration, it cleanses it. It cleanses it. And today, when I look at them. It doesn't mean that, oh, because I pray for them, I now want to become a Muslim. No. But when I look at them today, I no longer see a people that I hate. I used to hate them. I used to think God hate them also. Because after all, they are anti-Christian. Ma. I'm the Christian. Ma. They are anti-Christian. So God should hate them as well. But no. Because, because when I pray, my heart becomes a more aligned to the heartbeat of God. And when I look at the Malays today, I no longer see a people to hate, a people who is against me, a people who who wants the worst for me. No, I see a people who are desperately in need of the love of God. I see a group of people who are just so pitiful, because from the day that they were born, they were indoctrinated to hate Jesus Christ. They are one and only savior, the only salvation for their lives, and yet they were trained to hate him. They were trained to reject him. Can you see how pitiful they are? That the gospel has been cut off from them from the day they were born, not because of any other reason, but just because they were part of that racial group. And when I look at them, they can be so certain about their religiosity. They can be so certain about what they are doing, but yet we know where they will end up. We know what will happen to them, and it cries to them. And today, when I look at them, I pity them. And when I look at them, my the heart of God fills me, and I feel the heart of God. I can feel the passion of God. I can feel the pain of God when He looks at them today, because that's how God looks. That's how God feels. But when we allow hatred to fill our hearts, we will never feel the heartbeat of God. We will never understand. The heartbeat of God. Same thing for our nation today, friends. You guys love Malaysia. Do you love Malaysia, or are you just so political, excite, politically excited because you love your way of life, because you love your lifestyle, because you love your middle, upper, middle income status, because you love your livelihood? Or do you love Malaysia? And friends, you cannot love Malaysia until you love seventy percent of the nation. You can't love Malaysia just by loving that twenty percent among you or that thirty percent. Is there? You will only love this nation when you start to love the seventy percent in this nation. I was singing this. You know this song before they started the service. I was just worshiping there. And I, I told Kai Chu, let's just sing that song. You know the 
the Malaysia for your glory, that one, Malaysia bagi kemuliaan. And I was sitting there, right there. And we came to the chorus and we were just singing, Malaysia for your glory, Lord. And suddenly I just felt the Holy Spirit's weight upon my heart. I was almost in tears there, you know, you know, I was just feeling that so... Because the Lord was just asking me is, do you really mean that? Do you want to see my glory in this land? Or is it you just want to see your livelihood being protected? Your lifestyle being protected? Your way of life? Or do you truly want to see my glory in this land? And if you do, what about the 70% that you choose not to love? What about the 70% that you choose to hate? Because until you love the majority of this nation, you can never love the nation. And so friends, I'm not talking about votes. I'm talking about your heart. As we come to a close, let us be people who would let love reign over hate. Because the church cannot afford to hate. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise. All honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we just come before you. I'm going to ask for your forgiveness, Lord. For the many times where we have chosen to hate, where we chose to be angry, where we, allow, where we choose to allow disappointment and dissatisfaction to rule our hearts. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. And Lord, this morning we ask Help us, Lord To let go of that hate Help us, Lord, to be people That would love the other side Even though we may have different political opinions But yet, we will love the other side that we will love the majority of this race. Because that's what we are called to do. To be a people called by God. To be a people that is different from the rest of the nation. And as the rest of the people, our friends, our relatives, are filled with hate and anger. Lord, let us be people who love. Especially the majority race. Help us to truly love the majority race. Lord, I just commit all of us unto your hands. Do that work in us, Lord. Cleanse that hate in us so that we will be people of love. Hallelujah.